and hope in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, think with me for the moment, or for, the, for a moment, uh, about the last thing that you prayed for. I mean, what was it? And more to the point, after this morning, I hope you'll see, is it a bold prayer? Or was it a, a basic prayer? You know the basic prayers, like, you know, God be with me today, God help me, God get this slow driver out of my face, <laughs> whatever the case may be, right? We pray bold prayers. Or was it something like, God, what are you doing? God, get up and help me. God, do you see what my life has become? Do you understand? Why aren't you doing anything about it? That's a bold prayer. Have you ever prayed a bold prayer like that? If so, for what? And maybe was it what you wanted most in your heart at that moment? Or were you doing it in such a way that you wanted God to reveal his best and his will for you, for his glory? And here's, here's my kind of operating principle here, because those things can and very often be different, right? What we want, sometimes more than anything in the world, is not what God has for us. And ultimately, you know what that means? That's not for our best, right? That's not for our good. But we can pray bold prayers all day, and they could be maybe a little selfish. And we never let God be God in the context of that. So I'm asking a lot of questions that I trust and I pray we can answer today from this bold psalm in Psalm 35. So head over there if you're not there already. Last week we pressed pause on the psalms and enjoyed one of our own superstar preacher, Elder Paul Fehrenbacher, did an excellent job of preaching through Philemon. Thank you, Paul. What a powerful message that was on forgiveness that we are never more like Christ than when we forget. Was it just me or anybody else convicted like last week? That was, he was throwing fire last week. That was serious. Thank you, Paul. Uh, programming note, this will be our last week in the Psalms next week. Uh, Pastor Josh is going to be pinch hitting. Uh, I'll be traveling a little bit and we're going to be, he's going to be taking us to Hebrews uh, chapter 4 or 5. I put it in the bulletin, not sure. I said, Josh, you can preach on anything you want as long as it's in the Bible. So... And then starting on the 30th, we were going back to Joshua. So a week earlier than we had reported, but uh, things changed a little bit with travel plans. So get ready to go back to Joshua, the book of Joshua, not Pastor Joshua, on the 30th. In the meantime, we finish with a bang here in the Psalms, and let's hit it as we have a lot of ground to cover. Look at the first 10 verses of Psalm 35, another Psalm of David we see. He says, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their walk be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause, they have hid their net for me. Without cause, they have dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him and let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. And all my bones will say, O Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. The poor and needy from him who robs him. And if we just pause there for a moment and take this first section. There is a great play on words in the first verse. Indeed, the first couple of verses. It captures the essence of the whole psalm. David saying, hey, Lord, contend with those who contend against me. Go fight with them who fight against me. Attack those who are attacking me and oh by the way it's for no reason that they are attacking me God and you know that it is without cause David is not picking on innocent people here he's being completely unjustly persecuted and what is his response 
right? Does he go on the attack? I mean, remember, this is David. David is a battle-hardened combat ninja Navy SEAL warrior. Like, remember the song they sang about him? Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. David could take care of business if he had to, but he's not. He could go and wipe them out, but he's not. What is he doing? He's teaching us once again to call on the name of the Lord, and he does so in a very, very bold way. He literally tells God, grab your weapons, God, and get in the fight. What are you doing? He has that, that undertone to it. He tells God to grab his shields, his spear, his javelin, his AR, his grenades, whatever the case may be. Oh, and also, in the process, assure me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Go and get them and in the process make me feel better, right? Because I am desperate and desolate and downtrodden. He asked God, let them be put to shame. Let them be put to dishonor. Let them be turned back and disappointed. We're going to see let them a lot in this song. It, it, psalm. It is, a, it is a Hebrew tense that conveys a, a, a desire of the will. That is what he wants. He's praying that, but he's going to pray it in a very specific way, which we'll see. Let them be like chaff in the wind. If you're unfamiliar with chaff, if you've not harvested any wheat lately, the idea is that you take the, chaff, the wheat in your hands and you go like this in a nice windy place called the threshing floor, and then all of the, the part that you don't want, the garbage, the chaff, blows away, usually on top of a hill or something like that. We saw a lot of those in Israel. And then the wheat kernels fall to the ground. That's the stuff you want. He says, yeah, let them be like chaff. Go like this and let them just blow away in the wind. Uh, better yet, actually, you should chase them. You should pursue them. Send the angel of the Lord after them as well. Let their way be dark and slippery and chase them. Let their destruction be on their heads. Again, David defends his innocence. He says, they come at me without cause. And after all this and every section, all three sections here this morning, there is praise. And look at verse 10, what it says. He says, then all my bones, we just sang about that, will say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him? He will give praise to God for God's deliverance and what he's done. But again, look back at some of these words in verse 2. God Take hold of your shield. Get in the fight. Draw your spear. Chase my pursuers. Who prays like this? These are bold prayers that David prays to God. You mean we can pray like this? We're allowed to pray like this? I mean, technically, this is what we call an imprecatory psalm. One commentator defines it as the imprecatory psalms cry out not only for the righteous to be vindicated but also for God to punish the wicked. So you see David saying that exactly. Vindicate me for I'm in the right here and go get them. Punish them. Punish the wicked. That's an imprecatory psalm. And that's kind of the point. David is calling on who to act? God. Not himself. He's calling on God to act. What David really is interested in here is God's justice. Not his agenda. And let's say it that way. That bold prayers seek God's justice, not our agenda. Bold prayers seek God's justice, not our agenda. If David was going to run off in his agenda, he just would have run off and cut their heads off. right? David does that sort of thing. Not now, not here. He's teaching us something. And when we come and talk about justice, we can feel some of that, can't we? I mean, it's, it's not fair what's happening to David. We feel that not fairness. Any of your kids ever say that? It's not fair, right? You feel that from the time that you are a little kid. We all feel injustice or perceived injustice, right? Now, it might not be true. It was sometimes really hard to keep a straight face when young Mikey and Morgan were trying to convince us that it wasn't fair. It's like, okay, let's talk about fair. We're not going to do that, right? We all feel this injustice. It's part of the divine stamp on our souls that God the creator has placed the imago Dei, the image of God in our hearts that when we see something that is 
anti-God, like injustice or sin, we feel it. And we're outraged at that. We're supposed to feel that way because it's God inside of us, right? But like David, we need to go to God with that. Not just take matters into our own hands. Two reasons why. First, I know this might be hard to think about, but we might be wrong. We might be wrong. Things that we think are unjust really might not be unjust. We might just be really hurt or we might be really involved. And especially as we look at this age in the internet, shocker, not everything you read or see on the internet is true. Right? Sometimes we get all fired up about a video that we saw that if you saw the whole context of the video, right, or an article that was posted, right, We need to remember that before we go riding off into battle. Sometimes we might be duped into someone else's agenda and we don't even know it. We need to be people of knowledge and truth. We have to resist the urge for the hot take. You know what the hot take is? When you see something and you respond. When somebody says something to you right away and you give it back to them right away. Don't do that. We need to think about things. We need to process things from a biblical perspective about God's justice, right? We might be wrong. But second, that doesn't mean we're not called to act sometimes. Sometimes we are called to act. Just because the model that David is giving us here of going to God doesn't mean that we never speak out against sin or we never speak out against injustice. There are times when we are called to act. There are times when we're called to speak up, defend those who are being oppressed, support the persecuted church, call sin what it is, sin. Speak out against racism or abuse or abortion. We work to prevent those things. We work against those things. We have to be able to talk about some of these sensitive issues too from a biblical perspective. And above all, keep in mind that we are looking like David for God's justice, not our own agenda. And let's just admit something else while we're on the topic. There is no human being on the face of this earth that has all the answers, right? It can't be. We're all sinners saved by grace. That's where we've got to throw ourselves on the wisdom and the mercy of God, just like David is doing here. This requires tremendous discernment, of course, to know how to act, what to say, how to react. And after searching our hearts, we see what is really there. Sometimes we find some ugly things, right? We resist that, ever resist that hot take and then think about it for a second and then say, wow, it's a really good thing that I didn't say what I was going to say because it would have been embarrassing. Our own agenda or the bigger, more glorious aspect of God's justice, God's glory and what is actually right. And still the main point remains, we seek God's justice, not our own agenda. And along with that, we look at others with compassion, even in the midst of unjust persecution. And we we learned that from David as well. Look at verse 11. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things I do not know. They repay, repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed in my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in the morning, in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. So people are gossiping about David, and not just little piddly stuff. They are being straight up malicious, our text says. Downright evil. They are repaying the good that David does with evil. His soul is bereft, which is an obscure word choice here by ESV. It means to be grieved or to be in despair, to have your soul feel desolate. And guess what? When his enemies were that way, what did he do? He mourned for them. 
He put on sackcloth and ashes. He fasted for them. He prayed for them with his head bowed low. Literally, literally the Hebrew is it's, he's talking and praying into his chest. In short, what? He had compassion on them. Was that returned? No. That was returned as what? Evil for what he did. As Christians, we are called to be compassionate. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 12, 15, among the marks of a true Christian. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It doesn't say anything about whether or not it gets returned to you, does it? Because our obedience to God is not dependent on what someone else is doing. It's dependent on us obeying God. Do we dare withhold compassion on those who are truly hurting? The Bible knows no such believer who would do that. Do we show compassion because we think it will be returned to us? Is that what we see David doing here? No, not at all. But how is David being returned for his goodness? Again, evil. When he falls, when he has calamity, what do they do? Laugh. They post about it on Facebook. They gather around and point at him. They laugh at him. They mock him. What is David's response to this unjust persecution? Bold prayers. Do you see what he says in verse 17? How long, God? Literally, Hebrew is, till what? How much more do you have to see? Because I know you see it. Why aren't you doing anything, is what he is saying. Are you just going to sit there and watch, is what he's saying? What more has to happen before you get in the fight here and help me and rescue me? So put these pieces together, okay? David expresses compassion for others even when it's not returned except for evil and persecution, right? How does that make you feel? How would that make David feel? How do you think David feels right now? Desperate might be a good word. His soul being desolate is a good word. Despondent in despair. And he says, out of the cry of his heart, how long, God? What more do I have to go through? What do I have to do for you to help me? But yet that came how? It started where? With a heart full of compassion. So it's our second thing about bold prayers. Bold prayers are from a heart full of compassion. They're from a heart full of compassion. And keep in mind, again, David is completely and truly 100% innocent here. He does nothing to deserve this persecution. In fact, he's the only one who's doing, actively doing good, right? He's the one showing compassion on his enemies. And Christians, we are, we are fe feeling people. When we see injustice, when we see pain, when we see evil, when we see the effects of sin in this world, we feel that. It bothers us. It should. Again, that's the divine stamp on our soul. It should bother us. And like David, we're called to respond, but he responds in compassion, even if his good is returned for evil. And what is our recourse when we are wronged? Revenge! No, it's not revenge. It can't be revenge. Our recourse is to pray bold prayers from a heart that is still full of compassion. However, let's get one thing right. We are not David here. Just like the story in David and Goliath, okay? I don't, I, I'm sorry if I'm bursting your Sunday school bubble. We're not David there either. We're Israel cowering in the bushes, okay? Here we're not David either. Who are we? We are the malicious witnesses in verse 11. We are the wretches in verse 15. We are the profane mockers of verse 16. We are the ones who return the goodness of God with evil. If you're a Christian here today, we're the ones who have spurned God's goodness and grace because we too, at one time, rejected his legitimate, gracious compassion and his authority over our lives as our benevolent king. We were the ones who returned his compassion for evil. So before we go thinking we're too much like David, we're not. But God did what? God's David here, right? From a heart full of compassion, he did what? 
He showed us forgiveness. He showed us grace when he didn't have to. He showed us mercy. He showed us forgiveness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we see this heart of Jesus when he was here walking around ministering. We see a passage like Matthew 9, which I'm pretty sure I put in your bulletins. Jesus says this in Matthew 9. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds watch this, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the harvest. Passion of Jesus drove him to the cross to provide the sacrifice for us, the ones who rejected him. The ones who said, no, we got it. The ones who said, I'm okay. I got my life. I'm in charge. I know right from wrong. And he responded with compassion and mercy. The New Testament tells us that this can only be received by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And this is all about what we're about here. So if you've not done that, I beg you to consider doing that. Because this is far too great. The cost is far too great to understand that we were once enemies of God, but what he has done has given us a way to be reconciled to him. I beg you to consider that and respond in faith. We were looking forward today to celebrating with two people publicly proclaiming their faith in Jesus and their transformed lives at baptism, which we still will on the 30th, and maybe we'll have more. But two souls who were once enemies of God, who God has then transformed through faith and repentance, who will give testimony to what he has done, like David's enemies, right? But now have been lavished with gracious, undeserving kindness and compassion. And this continues to grow as we grow in our faith. We continue to pray and live from that heart full of compassion. Because why? We continue to deepen our understanding of what God has done for us in Jesus. A wise man once said, you become a Christian and then you spend the rest of your life figuring out what that means. You understand deeper depths of the gospel and what the cross actually meant. And you walk it out. That sanctification as he grows us and changes us even in the midst of being unjustly persecuted, right? Even in the midst of a situation that you don't want to be in, right? He's still working. And when we see the gracious rescue of God, we respond in worship. And again, David does that in verse 18 here to close that section. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. When he gets to church, he's going to praise him because of what God has done. Yet, we're still permitted to cry out to God with bold prayers, but yet conforming our hearts to who he is. Look at verse 19. David says again, Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes. Let not, let not those who wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land. They devise words of deceit. They open their mouths wide against me. They say, aha, our eyes have seen it. They've caught him. You have seen, O Lord. Be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me. O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in your hearts, aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad. And say forevermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servants. And then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. And David, again, with more of the let them, don't let them. He's crying out to God with the desire of his will, and he's expressing that. That's fine to do. We're allowed to do that. We're encouraged to do that. 
It's fine in our prayers to express with emotion the desires of our hearts. How many times do we see that already in the Psalms? David says, don't let them mock me. They're actively trying and plotting against me. They're actively hating me. They're even not speaking peace to those in, around, those that are just innocent bystanders, he says. They're taking them out as well. They're waiting to catch me. They're waiting to say, aha, got you. I knew if we watched long enough, you would screw up, and we are right there. That's what he feels like. And check out the play in words in 21 and 22. He says they open their mouths wide against me. They say, aha, you know, we've seen it, finally saw it. But look at what he says in verse 22. Who has seen? God. You have seen God. There are people waiting for me to slip and fall, and they are watching. But you know who else is watching? My God. He says, you have seen, O Lord. David's enemies are watching, but someone else is watching. So were the eyes of his God. And once again, David prayers, prays then some very bold prayers in the midst of his desperation. What does he say? He said, this might be the strongest yet that he gets to. Look at verse 23. He says, awake and rouse yourself. In other words, get up. Wake up, God. Get yourself moving and save me for my vindication, Lord. What are you doing? Why are you silent, he says. I'm innocent here. Vindicate me. Don't let them say that we got him right where we want, want him. Let them be put to shame, not me. Bold prayers again. Look at something closely with me that reveals in the midst of David's bold prayers what he's actually after. Look at 23 and 24. Again, he's, he's not shy about praying for his vindication, right? For his cause. Vindicate me, O Lord my God. Look at, look at according to your righteousness, he says. Not mine. He says according to your righteousness, and David continues to pray for his vindication and his justice, but only as it's subject to who? God's righteousness. And here's the point. Bold prayers are in line with God's will. And bold prayers are in line with God's will. We shouldn't be praying bold, selfish prayers. Right? We should be praying bold prayers that are in line with God's will. Well, how do we know God's will, Pastor Mike? It's right here, and the Holy Spirit, and guys like me who stand up and, and hopefully explain it. This is how David has been praying this whole psalm. Each of these main sections, again, ends with prayer and worship. <clears throat> Look at verse 27. That's what, he, that's what he ends with. That's what he wants at the end. He says, let those who delight in my righteousness shout for, glad and be glad, or shout for joy and be glad, and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servants. He says, my tongue will tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Just look at those verses and breathe that in for a moment. Did you, did you see that? The Lord is great who delights in what? In the welfare of his servants. Our heavenly father delights in our good. Our Heavenly Father delights in our prospering, dare I say. Not physically, not necessarily physically, but spiritually. He delights in our spiritual good. He delights in our good, even when we don't see it. God is for his children, not against them. God is for our good, and prayer is how we see that. And specifically, the good is when our hearts are conformed to God's will. When we grow in the image and likeness of God. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And oh boy, is this a misunderstood topic in the church today. Right? We get this whole idea that God's for my good, which is yes, and that is true. But what does that really mean? Right? Because sometimes we get the idea that we can just pray for whatever we want and if we have enough faith that God will give it to us. Or if we put on those magic words, in Jesus' name, right? like a little tagline that will just kind of secure the thing that we want, then, then that's a little bit extra that we should do. 
Jesus prays or Jesus teaches us in John 14, 13 and 14, how to pray, what, what, what it means. John 14, 13, he says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Did you catch that? What you ask for in my name, everybody goes, cool, goes to the Bible and says whatever they want, and then they tack on in Jesus' name. No, he says, so that what? The Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you do something in the name of someone else, you're doing something in a way that they would approve of in their name. I'm praying in the name of Jesus in a way that would please Jesus. I'm not praying for something that would be opposite of what Jesus would want. I'm praying for something that would bring glory to him, that would bring glory to the Father. The same thing David closes, or the same reason David closes each section with worship and praise. Same thing that David wants, God's glory. David wants God's glory, and that's why he closes each section with praise. And praying something in Jesus' name is not a tagline that we put on the end of every prayer. It's a statement of faith in the power of the name of Jesus and an intent to conform our requests to his will for the glory of God. When we're praying something and we pray in Jesus' name, we should be thinking and checking, is my heart really truly in line with what Jesus would have for me? And is this glorifying? Is this glorifying to God if I get it? These are bold prayers that take our agenda off the table and train our hearts to submit to God's will for God's glory. Watch this for our good. Because that's the good, is when we submit to God's will. Boldly praying in Jesus' name isn't a way to get what we want. It's the way we lay down what we want and ask God to do what is best. And so I'll say that this morning, that bold prayers aren't for what we want. They are for what's best. That's what we see David here doing in the midst of this bold psalm, praying bold prayers for what is best, setting his agenda aside, trusting in God to act. Remember, even in the face of what? Unjust persecution. Seeking God's agenda, God's justice rather, not our agenda. Maintaining a heart full of compassion even when the sentiment is not returned. Seeking to know what God's will is and praying boldly in line with that so it brings glory and honor to who? Him, not us. Because church, we always have to be suspicious of ourselves. Always. Our hearts will always want to pull us towards our own comfort. Right? I think it was Luther that said we're bent inwardly on ourselves. Always. That gets into our prayers, people. We need to remember that. That's why when we go to God, we see the attitude of David saying, do this, but I'm kind of holding this loosely, God, because I'm interested in your glory. Do what you're going to do and glorify yourself. We always need to be suspicious of ourselves. That's why we need a standard outside of ourselves. God doesn't leave the Christian life open to our own interpretation. He has revealed himself in his Word, by his spirit. This is the realization that we always have growing to do. Sanctification is an ongoing process until we are with him in glory. The elders labored very hard over the sanctification paragraph in the doctrinal statement, and we like it a lot. It's the idea that it is ongoing, looking more like sin, or hope, looking more like Christ, (laughs) and less like sin. with that comes a realization that only God knows what is truly best for us. And we've got to trust him with that, church. And sometimes the things we want, how we want situations to resolve, we think that our lives should look like this. And really, that's not the best. And the best is defined as what would be for God's glory. What would conform us more to God's will? We're like, yeah, but that's hard. I know. Happens to me too. I'm not immune to it. But it is what is best. We have to trust him with that. God 
is the best for us. God has the best for us. And it comes with seeking his justice and living a life after his compassion and seeking to align our lives with his will. And ask yourself, what am I diligently praying for? And am I doing so with an open hand and letting God be God? Do you trust God to say no? I can almost guarantee you that we're not in a situation as bad as David was, right? I'm pretty safe pastoral grounds that no one here today or watching online is being chased by a king and his army who want to put your head on a pole. Pretty sure that's not happening, right? And that's not to take away from anything. I know that people are facing some very tough situations, very scary things, very disheartening things. But let's learn how God wants us to pray in this. Maybe even especially in the midst of those extreme circumstances. And church, our God delights in the welfare of his servants. We are allowed to crawl up in our father's lap like David just said. We are allowed to have those moments, right? It's shocking. Where he says, what are you doing? Why aren't you helping? Why aren't you answering? That's grace, right? He's not going to zap us into a smoking pile of dust if we do that. It's grace. He understands who we are. And God delights in the welfare of his servants. And we do so with that perspective that we have remaining sin. That we're not God and he is and we trust him and we seek him. And bold prayers then, as David teaches us, aren't for what we want. They're for what's best. Let's pray that God conforms our hearts to this. Let's pray that we can pray this way. Let's pray that God is glorified in the midst of it. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your grace, as we are weak human beings, Lord, as we see things around us that we want to respond to that we think should be differently or different, and as we, within our own hearts, our own situations, we want desperately sometimes things that you are not bringing. Or maybe what you are bringing, we want you to take it away. Lord, we pray that you will conform our hearts to your will, that we would want supremely to glorify you and to be conformed to your image, and that we could stand in praise and glory of who you are, even in those times when you say no, because we trust you and you are good. Help us, God. These are hard things. These are difficult things. Be glorified as we seek to live lives more conformed to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing about God's mercy as we respond to his word.